Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, aloha, greetings to all of our viewers today. My name is Iman Ali and I am the Policy and Programming Coordinator here at the Muslim Public Affairs Council. For those who do not know, the Muslim Public Affairs Council is a national public affairs organization that involves American Muslims in government, media, and community for a more inclusive America for all. Emma Lazarus, the poet whose work is found at the feet of the Statue of Liberty, a beacon welcoming generations of immigrants who came to the United States to forge a better life for themselves and their families, once said, until we are all free, we are none of us free. In his bold and tenacious tone, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. echoed similar sentiments by saying, no one is free until we are all free. Even the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was an advocate for equity and justice and peace, bolstering the most marginalized in his community consistently and having his final sermon be devoted to the importance of maintaining women's rights. We have looked to our history books and we have searched our scriptures and found role models for good work. But now, as the clock slowly but surely ticks towards our time to take responsibility, we must recognize the importance of peace building. That is why today's webinar continues MPAC's ongoing educational webinar series and is the first webinar in a new series called Conversations That Hashtag Offer Peace, with our, which our partner, The Peace Studio, is hosting regularly from now until November 1st in coordination with its ongoing 100 Offerings of Peace campaign. For those unfamiliar with their work, or for those who just want to hear the good again, the Peace Studio, a nonprofit based in New York City, was created in 2016 with a mission of supporting, training, and uniting artists, journalists, and storytellers to inspire people everywhere to become active peace builders. Since July 1st, the Peace Studio has been commissioning daily pieces and original content from creatives spanning 20 countries around what peace means to them how they practice it, and where they could see it rise up and flourish amidst COVID-19 and the impassioned protests over centuries of radical injustices. Salam al Mariyadi, MPAC's superstar and president, was thrilled to participate on day 31 of the campaign, and we are excited that his participation led us to today's webinar. Joining Salam in conversation today is Dr. Maya Sotero. In addition to being the co-founder of the Peace Studio, she is also the co-founder of two Hawaii-based nonprofits, Seeds of Peace and the Institute for Climate and Peace. Dr. Maya also serves an, as an advisor to the Obama Foundation, working specifically to develop the Asia Pacific Leaders Program and is a faculty member at the Matsunaga Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution at the University of Hawaii. Maya is the author of numerous books, including a picture book called Ladder to the Moon, and is currently under contract to write another young adult novel called Yellowwood. Joining Maya and Salam is today's moderator, a journalist, filmmaker, and producer, Mariam Ishani. She has covered global news and conflict issues in the Middle East and North Africa for some of the largest news audiences in the world, including The Guardian, Foreign Policy Magazine, BBC, and Routers. Currently, she reports for Agents France Press as a journalist in the Asia Pacific region covering political and trade issues. Mariam is also scheduled to create her own offering of peace later this fall, joining Salam and taking part in the Peace Studio's 100 Offerings of Peace campaign. Remember, peace is not merely the absence of war. It is a feeling of security, freedom of fear, and ability to celebrate oneself while appreciating the differences in others. Peace is a responsibility, peace is a goal. Now I'm gonna pass the mic over to our moderator, Maria Mashani, to get the ball rolling. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Iman, for that introduction. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am as an individual, but as a journalist to be speaking to you, Dr. Maya Satora, Maya, Aloha, and Mr. Al Mariati, um, because I think Probably we all have experience and know that in times like we are in now that can be as complicated as could lead to a conversation like this to be happening on Zoom um, or when some of the most pivotal conversations might happen. So I'm, I'm very honored to be here today, um, hoping to moderate some of that, uh, the questions that we all have on our minds right now. 
I actually want to start with you, um, Maya. In 2018, you said that peace building needs a rebranding. Just so just two years ago. And that what we misunderstood about peace is that it's passive and you really see it as a hard edge, get your hands dirty, weight bearing work. Can you talk to us a little about what you mean by that? What a robust peace building or peace centered institution is? What are its deliverables? Thank you so much for the question and salam and thank you for having me here. I am, you know, grateful for that opening question because I do think that peace is often misunderstood as, as being something that is aspirational but um, ultimately not pragmatic. And I do see it as quite the opposite. And so any institution that works to improve the lives of others and positively impact the community is a peace institution to me. So perhaps these are institutions that address the sustainable development goals or you know, move forward the positive peace global index, which looks at criteria like well-functioning government, good relations with neighbors, human and civil rights. Basically, peace organizations uh, are those that connect, um, build community, transform conflicts, nurture social justice, environmental justice, equity. And so any individual who is working towards pragmatic positive peace building is a peace builder in my view. Um, they are educators, whether nonprofit for-profit, governmental, recreational, um, you know, individuals who help us and organizations to engage a peace building leadership and civic engagement and think beyond profit efficiencies and ease are peace builders. And I think that everyone has a place to enter the stream. Everyone has a way that they can contribute um, as bridge builders, um, as, as nurturers, healers, to offer inspiration and, and connection. So my hope is that uh, through this webinar and other uh, shared endeavors that we can convince everyone to wash their eyes and see themselves anew and choose to participate in ways that um, are perhaps unprecedented and uh, build their peace building leadership in doing so. Thank you so much for that. Mr. Amayati Salam, I wanted to turn that over to you. So you are one of those individuals that I think of as very much having done that weight bearing work in very practical and very um, ways that we can see the reform and the progress that has happened since you started the Muslim Public Affairs Council in 1988. Whenever I think of that, I just, I have to stop and take a minute and think about the context in which you began that work. The sentiment towards Muslim Americans could not have been poorer. And my perception is, maybe this is incorrect, my perception is that you would likely have gone out very often and not found a lot of sympathy or a lot of allies right away. When you see young people today working in an environment that maybe their issues are being misrepresented or misunderstood and there's a lot of closed doors in their faces, what do you tell them about how to get those doors open? How did you even get your foot in the door? That's a, that's a great question. And you know, first of all, let me just thank you, Miriam and, and Maya, for joining us. Uh, we're really honored. It's, it's really is a true honor uh, to uh, work with uh, and be partnership uh, in uh, the, the project with the Peace Studio. Uh, to me, that is the essence of our work. And if, if uh, we as a faith community do not have the center uh, of our work uh, around peace, then we're really not a true faith. We're not an authentic faith. Um, that is the mission of every faith. And Islam stands for that. It is submission to God in order to achieve inner peace uh, and to establish peace throughout society. Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. God says, he, he, uh, God invites you to the, uh, to the abode of peace in the Quran. And he also talks about how people fan the flames of war and God keeps extinguishing those, uh, those flames uh, of war. So to be with God means that you have to be working for peace. And, and, and you're right. Usually in that field, you are very lonely. 
uh, sometimes you feel you're on an island. On the one hand, you're on an island within your own community because your community needs that leadership and, and how far off you go from them, sometimes you feel like you're alone. Um, and, and then from the larger society, it, it, you are ignored at the beginning. And, and, and so you feel alone there as well. So that is going to be the territory within which we work. It can be a lonely road uh, for quite some time. But if we have that conviction, if we have that sincerity of the work, in time, people will occupy that space for peacemaking because they will realize, and we all, real, we all know, that we as a world cannot continue to operate with the status quo. And so what is it that we need to do to change that? And that change requires serious self-introspection. And, and one of the good things, and you know, I'm sure we're going to be talking about that later, is uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, the situation we're all living under COVID, it, it is giving us that opportunity for introspection. I want to actually um, focus on what you just said there. I think often when people hear the term peace building, they may have a perception that it is, it's maybe not necessarily a positive term. It may feel like a form of appeasement. They may think, you know what, the time for dialogue, the time for um, bridge building is over. You know, there's, there's too much at stake. We're out of time. Um, you know, this is actually just going to buy time for the status quo to continue when we really need to tear it down. What do you say to individuals who are ready to kind of shut the door on maybe the types of partnerships you might have worked with in the past, um, the types of alliances you might have reached out to and say, we're not working with them anymore. anymore. We're only going forward with those who share our values and who are committed to doing the hard work. Well, I mean, as, as uh, Iman was, was talking earlier, and it's actually a quote from Martin Luther King, uh, peace is not the absence of tension. Peace is the presence of justice. So we, we have to be working with others in order to, to achieve justice. And we don't have to work with people based on where we want them to be. We have to work with people based on where they are. You're, you're, all the prophets, every prophet that we read about never worked with people that were at the level of, of the prophets themselves. They were at a, a level where they needed that development, they needed that support, they needed that guidance. And so it is our responsibility to help. Number two, it, it, it really centers around the issue of what is compassion? If we believe that our faith is about compassion, then we have to remove that barrier with the other. I believe that a lot of differences are, are, are really um, as made out of artificial barriers we make with each other that because I am Muslim and you're Baha'i or she is Jewish or Christian or whatever, well then why, why should I work with you because you have a different faith, you have a different political objective. And it, it really uh, behooves us to work with that understanding uh, of working with differences, differences in uh, ethnicity, differences in race, differences in religious perspectives, and differences in political pers uh, perspectives, because God wants us to manage those differences and become one human family. That requires compassion. And if you can't work with the other, that means that you don't have any compassion. And that's what you should be working on within yourself to begin with. Maya, I'd like to um, talk about something that uh, Iman mentioned in the intro. Both you and Salam have worked very closely um, in the development of your projects with, with culture makers and with media makers. Both of you actually decided to go to the forefront of issues and say, we're going to look at perception and meaning in our public space. Um, the Offerings of Peace program um, that, you're, that the Peace Studio has started just almost two months ago. How did you envision that? And why has that been such a big commitment for the Peace Studio to work with culture makers and these voices? Thank you. This um, 100 Offerings of Peace helps us to see uh, peace builders um, who have not been lauded and applauded and, and um, 
made visible, I think, uh, to, to others in the way that we feel is justified. Many of these uh, folks are emerging creatives and uh, all of them in the aggregate help us to see the rich tapestry uh, of human and artistic offering that exists there that can help us to care for one another and, and help us to understand ways to participate and uh, innovative solutions that uh, we have at our disposal in our communities. So creatives help us with empathy, they help us to heal our suffering, but they also help us to inspire action in our own uh, communities, in our own faiths, in our own organizations. These offerings have personally greatly inspired me during a time of loss and change and uncertainty in my own life in recent months, and I hope that others experience uh, and discover uh, solace in uh, their offerings. Um, Nesima Abera is uh, uh, one that comes to mind. She did a poem and a short film about uh, Eritrean refugees um, around coffee. Um, making and sharing, and that nourished a deep sense of kinship to me and a sense of belonging. Lyric Jackson has um, an offering called Alien Woman that combined dance, improvisation, image, photography, and helped me to think about how to love and care for myself, uh, my body, and, and reminded me uh, to use meditation and, and reminded me that I'm not alone in my experiences. Um, tied to foe's circle of spaciousness, I think is what it's called, or it, it uh, offered real symbolic elegance and made me reconsider and draw upon my own um, tools and uh, images of spiritual sustenance uh, in spite of the solitude and distance. So we are in a place where many of us are feeling broken and empty and um, offerings like uh, Salam's uh, offering and Reverend Telford reminds us that um, we can take our personal definitions um, and actions for peace and amplify them to the larger community, but also um, we see how helping uh, the larger community also helps our children. Um, and, you know, within these challenging times, we see opportunities for creation coming together. Uh, we're reminded of our interconnectedness and these creatives really um, I believe help us all to understand and not only celebrate our shared humanity, but then act upon that understanding. Wonderful, thank you. Before I go on to my next question, I really want to just uh, remind the audience, those who are watching, that if you have questions about what we're discussing and this is raising questions for you, please do submit them through the chat or through the Facebook Live so that we can make sure we, we hear from you as well and that this is um, a conversation with you as well. I wanted to ask you, um, Salam, you wrote just this past weekend for Newsweek that we need more American Muslims in public life. And I wanted to talk to you about, you said that, that IMPACT is going to make um, a concerted effort to identify more young individuals, new leaders to be in policy positions. And I wanna ask you about what you have seen to be the barriers to participation and what it is you're going to look at removing from people's paths in order to allow that to happen. Obviously for not just um, Muslim Americans, but to have greater diversity in policy positions, even in civil society where we do see a lack of diversity and representation. That, that, that's correct. And, and we're not just working on diversity in government, but we're working for diversity in the federal bench. There, there's not enough diversity uh, of people of color, people of different backgrounds who are, who are judges for uh, for us today. And within the government, it's the same problem. You, you go to a meeting into the State Department and they're talking about Iraq and Syria and Indonesia and, and Kashmir and India, and none of them have a clue as to really what the politics or the religious or the, uh, the political or the religious uh, or the um, economic situation is on the street. They talk to their counterpart in those governments and the governments over there are saying, well, everything is fine. Uh, what you're hearing is just a lot of noise. And so that is the main barrier. It's not a barrier for us as Muslims. We, 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 we'll get involved and we'll make our voices known, 
but the barrier is America's barrier um, towards achieving peace in the region. And look at how many wars we've had in the last 20, 20 years or 40 years. Uh, we've had Iraq. Uh, we've had uh, what's happening in Somalia and the Sudan. Uh, we had uh, Afghanistan. And then all the other conflicts as, that result from that, the skirmishes um, that happened throughout uh, the region, the, the uh, occupation of Palestinian territories, what's, what happened in Lebanon last week, um, what's happening in Iran that's getting, it's getting worse, a, a worse situation for the people and the mullahs uh, are, are, are continuing to have their reign uh, uh, and, and imposition on the people. We need experts uh, and expertise guidance on those issues. And that is not there. So it is not an issue for, oh, let us get a quota of Muslims and see how we can, you know, you know uh, make them happy. No, it's about peace and war, war and peace. It's about democracy. If we want democracy, then we have to listen to the sentiment of the people. And we are not doing that as a country. We claim that we're for democracy, but our foreign policy at the very least is anything but democratic. And obviously there are people here that are questioning our democracy at home as well. But believe you me, what is happening in, in, uh, in the region there is much worse. And therefore we need to remove those barriers so at least our decision makers would have educated uh, approaches towards solving these problems. Thank you. I want to um, ask you both. You have both, on this issue, you have both worked very closely with the highest levels of administration. Salem, you're uh, an advisor to the vice president and current presidential candidate Joe Biden. Um, Maya, you obviously have worked to support your brother, the former president's work. What do you, would you consider, if, if you were in an opportunity to tell an incoming administration or even uh, this current administration going forward is at stake. How would you convey what is at stake right now when we talk about enforcing or, or reinforcing um, centering peace at the core of the government's work? What would be the thing that you think they need to understand is so critical about right now? Go ahead, Maya. <laughs> Let you go first. Okay, sure. Thank you. I mean, I think that everything is at stake, you know, the um, the soul of our nation, so to speak. I think that uh, right now we need more than ever to have examples of powerful inclusion. We need to cast the net widely, not simply to benefit those whom we invite to the table and into the room, but indeed for all of us, because when people are excluded, when people are ignored or rendered invisible, then all of us lose. We lose out on these incredible talents. Um, my feeling is we need to have a strength-based approach wherein we see the strength that is to be found in the stories of many and in the contributions of all. I think that, you know, where we are true to our values and mission as a nation and as leaders. Um, we have to think well beyond the personality and the participation of those whom we elect. And we need to think about everyone's contribution. Civic engagement is not just about voting. It is about real participation on the ground every day, um, helping to build our beloved community. And we, um, I think, have to um, get people to feel excited about the great project of democracy um, that is fragile at times and has been, in my view, um, underdeveloped of late. Um, and we need to meet this time uh, when we have needs in public health and education in, uh, in human um, connection and understanding. Uh, we need to meet this time with great momentum. And, um, uh, and if we bring um, voices um, into the table to the table and into the room that have not yet been there um, our endeavors are enriched not to mention our life sojourn which becomes vastly more interesting 
I want to, I want to build on that exactly what Maya said and uh, just point to a few examples though on, in terms of our challenge. It's the year is 2020 and we are still um, we're, we're, we're haunted by uh, the reality of dealing with concentration camps against people in China who happen to be Muslim, the Uyghurs. We're dealing with a genocide of the Rohingya and the slow genocide, the silent genocide of the people of Kashmir. We're dealing with the refugee crisis of Syria as they're dealing with a tyrant there. And what really pains me as an American is here I am, a citizen of the United States of America, the strongest power in the world, the superpower of the world, the leader of world civilization. And when I talk to policymakers, they act as if they are helpless, that they have to deal with so many other issues that it's difficult. And so what do our words mean anymore when we talk about freedom and justice for all, when we talk about being a beacon of hope and democracy for the world and, and all these words, does it mean that we, we just pack it in and, and go? Absolutely not. So that is what is at stake. What is at stake is whether we're going to stand up to tyranny or not. And if we can't stand up to tyranny with, uh, with our actions, then at least our words. Let us at least be in agreement that this, what is happening um, in these areas is evil and let us speak towards that evil. It's just amazing, however, that you talk about that, they can't do anything, yet they want to go and create war in the Middle East and, and bomb and uh, do more detentions and carry out more covert operations. Yet when you talk about the Uyghurs and the Rohingyas and the Kashmiris and, and even what's happened in India and so on and so forth, then, oh, we're sorry, we, we don't know how to deal with Russia and China and India and we have to, we have to maneuver and, and things like that. that. We shouldn't accept that as a people. Um, this is the commemoration, by the way, in Islam uh, of Muharram. And in Muharram, uh, there was a figure named Imam Hussein who stood up against tyranny. And as a result, he was killed. It is our time to stand up for tyranny, uh, stand up against tyranny. It is our time to witness for the, the, the peacemakers, uh, to witness for those who are oppressed. That is the first pillar of Islam, to be witness. That is a major pillar in Christianity and in every other faith, to be a witness. That is what Jesus did, to be that witness. And are we going to be that witness for the oppressed, for those standing up against tyranny or not? I, I believe that's the existential question that our country has to answer. We have um, just a few more minutes before we turn over to questions. And I want to just ask, one question which came up um, a little bit earlier, but in the context of, of COVID, which I think we look through everything now through the context and the lens of COVID, more than ever in the last few months, what I think people are feeling is that they've turned inwards, maybe become a bit more insular, more focused on uh, the people nearest to them, their families, and maybe shut their doors to a lot of things they were paying attention to before. How do you as an individual uh, go out, uh, and, I'll, and I'll turn to, to you, Maya, first, and then to you, Salam. I'd like to hear about how you uh, keep the issues that are so critical long-term to our societies and our communities at the forefront of people's thoughts when they might be kind of really more than ever focused uh, on themselves and on their families and on just uh, the, the days in front of them. Well, I think that um, we, need to have hope that the world that we um, will find when we emerge from this pandemic will be one that is worthy of our love and um, our, our commitment. And so we can't simply ignore the things that are happening now, whether it's a racial inequity that is um, uh, exacerbated by this pandemic, whether it is, you know, conflict and strife. Uh, if we do that, then we are going to um, emerge from this pandemic um, uh, broken and devastated 
um, rather than wiser. Um, we have to lean into our discomfort now, and we have to realize what we don't know. Um, and yes, we have to raise our voices and protest, and protest is an important part of our change making, you know, the, the, um, but we have to have more than a sort of cancel culture. We have to um, make sure that we are choosing to participate in whatever ways we can in building our beloved community and articulating what we want to see uh, and where we want to move beyond criticism to action. There's so much that we can do from where we are right now to nurture greater understanding and cooperation and compassion. We can share and uh, learn the stories of so many who are suffering, but also um, in the blogging and vlogging and self-publication and the social media work that we do, we can be activists and movement builders. We can, you know, advocate for greater inclusion and fairness in our organizations and our communities. We can re-envision and rework uh, through, you know, careful design thinking um, our um, various uh, personal as well as public endeavors. And so this is not a time to be insular. Uh, it is certainly a time for reflection, but since we cannot connect in person, we must connect with our broader communities. We must use whatever tools, technologies, and resources we have uh, to reiterate our, um, our responsibility and our commitments uh, and our love for one another. Um, because of course, this pandemic has shown us to be interconnected in ways that we perhaps previously didn't understand um, as well as we surely must now. Yes, and, and uh, exactly what Maya said, that we must use the opportunity of, of stillness from COVID-19, being in our homes uh, and isolation for introspection. Um, and again, this is the lesson of every faith, that every prophet of every faith took time for seclusion and came back and worked with the people. And, you know, Moses wanted to spend all that time with God. And God said, you need to go back to your people because they need you. So even God is telling Moses, that the way to serve God is not to just sit with me as God, but go and serve your people. That is the definition of religion, is serving God by serving your people. So if we're not using this opportunity for introspection and figuring out ways to be more effective in our work, then I, it is a wasted opportunity. We have the most important election coming up in just 70 days. If we are not working not just for the presidency in terms of who's going to win the presidency, but members of Congress, the U.S. Senate. The U.S. Senate is going to determine what kind of judges we're going to have for the next 20 to 30 years in, in it because they're empowered with confirming every federal uh, appointee. And uh, our local races as well and state propositions in terms of human security. You know, our national security apparatus is filled with all these programs that are built on militarization, policing, and surveillance. And we spend about a trillion dollars a year for national security. Yet you ask any American, do you feel secure? And the answer is likely, no, I, I don't feel secure. That's because government should be responsible for economic security, for health security, for housing security, for racial equality, or at least preventing racial uh, injustice from creeping into government. That is where our security apparatus should be focusing on human security, not just uh, how to, to build more weapons and, and to sell it to more countries and let them use it on their own people. And then we, then we have a, another peace problem that we have to deal with afterwards. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think at this point would be a perfect time to turn over to the questions from our viewers. Um, Iman, I know you've been looking at them very closely and selecting ones that you think would really help all of us understand this conversation even further. Absolutely. So thank you to, to everyone who turned in a question. Um, we have quite a few, so I'm going to get the ball rolling right away. Um, so um, for, for both Salam and, and Dr. Maya, you know, you both have emphasized a world focused on peace building. Um, and while the hope for a better future is most certainly a catalyst of motivation for many of us, for those who that might not be enough, you know, that might not be enough of a motivation, what does a world without 
peace building look like? What is a future where we say, we don't care if we're good, that's enough for us. I think the question is for Maya. Either one. Do you want to start Maya or? <laughs> sure. Well, it's, it's not a world I want to see. I think that um, we have built into our biologies a, um, a real predisposition for connection. We um, focus a lot on competition uh, as um, uh, our biological imperative, but I think that we are actually built to um, mirror one another and to connect and thereby thrive. And I think that um, a world without peace building, one that is um, left to those whose voices are simply the loudest and whose um, you know, actions create the largest explosion would be a very sad world indeed. Um, my, I was very fortunate to um, grow up with a mother who emphasized service as an antidote to loneliness. And, um, and as a teenager, I did myself experience a little depression until I started to give to others, until I realized that there was so much that I could do and that there was much greater power in um, building peace and, and connection than um, in competing with others. And we didn't have a lot of money when we got to the US from Indonesia. Mom was a single mom. I was a scholarship kill, kid. So I... Um, I really um, saw and understood um, service um, from the perspective of those who you know, do not have. And when we serve one another, um, we serve ourselves too. And service is not just about a one-off activity, a one-time act of volunteering. It's not charity. We are changed by true um, service and peace building, which you know, offers our time and our energy and our our love for greater justice and well-being. Um, and so I think about a, a world without that kind of service. And I think um, that, you know, that is a world where we stop learning, um, where uh, we cease to have, you know, hope and optimism. When we act as peace builders, we renew our own sense of um, uh, empowerment and, um, it, we uh, feel that our lives are relevant and meaningful. Absolutely. I think it's the easiest thing to, to become selfish and, and think that our issues are the greatest, but to live a selfish life is easy, but I don't think that that's really life, right? It, it's good to think about others. And Salam, I would love to hear your insights on this as well. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, let me just give you four, you know, what we believe our four steps are at the Muslim Public Affairs Council uh, for Peacemaking. The first step is, is to be that witness, uh, a witness uh, for the oppressed, uh, for those um, who suffer from war and, and, and to be uh, refugees in the world, uh, for the homeless in our society as well. So to be witnesses for them in serving the Almighty. Number two, to be a soldier for peace. And that means fighting any kind of hatred or racism, starting with yourself. Uh, in Islam, the greatest jihad, the word jihad means struggle. Um, and, and the greatest jihad is the struggle against the self. So if you want to fight racism out there, then you have to deal with the racism and the bias in your own heart first. So to be that soldier for peace, starting with yourself and then defending uh, those who are mistreated in the world today. Then the third is to be that spokesperson for peace to speak out for justice and equity. And as the Quran says, you have been made, O you of faith, to be a people of equity and be witnesses to God, even if you have to testify against yourself or your own parents or your own community. So to be that spokesperson uh, for peace and justice. And then the fourth is to be that ambassador uh, for peace, to, to seek that seat at the table for peacemaking. And, to, and you will be given that opportunity, whether it is peacemaking at your street 
or peacemaking at your school or peacemaking in the nation or peacemaking in the world. There are many seats to fill for peacemaking because the war makers, unfortunately, are, uh, are at the seat of the table, uh, have a seat at the table. Well, we need to uh, counter that with having peacemakers having a seat at the table. And as the Quran says, if you don't band together for peace, the others will band together and corruption and oppression will continue to spread throughout the world. So it's being a witness for peace, a soldier for peace, a spokesperson for peace, and being that ambassador for peace. It almost sounds like you're both suggesting that peace building is actually a selfish, selfish exercise, that we're doing it for ourselves. All, always. Every, religion really is telling you, if you want to do something for yourself, do that first, and then the rest will take care of itself. It's wonderful. You know, you guys have inspired me now to figure out the peacemaking role that I can have in my own home. I think I'm not going to squabble with my sisters as much now uh, okay. over little things, but that's where it starts. And, and our next question goes right into that is that, you know, we can all have a part in peace building. Um, and this uh, viewer would like to know from both of you the role that each generation can play, specifically the younger generation who are still in the process of finding their purpose. Thank you. I, I, um, I am so grateful to be a lifelong educator and I learn so much from my students all the time. It helps to keep me um, a lifelong learner and I'm reminded of when I was in New York, we had these service days on Wednesdays and they, they were entirely student led and implemented and the students would talk about how they were changed. I could see them growing ever stronger uh, and feeling more capable. And they are the reason we do what we do, the reason that we care so much. Um, they inspire us, young people do, but also they have so much ingenuity, so much creativity. They're not grounded in things the way they have been. There's a natural progressive element that enables them to find new solutions that we maybe haven't thought of. And so as an educator, I um, am in a constant state of learning. And I find that um, by working with young people, my, um, my own um, capacity to um, assist is greatly enhanced. And um, I um, am able to articulate more deeply um, my values and mission. Young people do give me hope. Sometimes they're missing out on some historical context, which we have to help them with, but they are just naturally more inclusive. They know um, BS when they hear it. They in want to invite um, more voices uh, and people to uh, participate. And um, I am incredibly grateful for the ever expanding understanding and ever growing family that young people have brought to me. Yes, I, you know, I, I believe that we have to create more space for young people um, to empower them, um, to support them, to guide them. Uh, uh, but there isn't that space right now within our, our, our mosques um, and, and some of our organizations. And so we need to create that space uh, because they will find a cause elsewhere if they don't find a cause within our community. And we're losing that. Uh, I think every faith community is suffering from that. And then uh, for young people, um, I also want, want to admonish them that you know, there's no entitlement in this, in this uh, project. Uh, a great man by the name of Muhammad Yunus, a Nobel laureate, he, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for microfinancing in ba Bangladesh. He microfinanced all these uh, small uh, uh, companies for, for women, poor women in Bangladesh. And he told us one time something I'll never forget. He said, you know, he, he, sp he speaks to these young people coming out of college and say, I got my degree, where's my job? And he told them, nobody promised you a job just because you have a degree, you have to create it yourself. You have to create that opportunity. And so this idea of entitlement is something that is outside uh, our faith. And, 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 so, and, and therefore young people, um, just because you are here and you're outspoken, doesn't mean that the job is, is complete. It, it requires sacrifice. It requires creating opportunities for others. It requires uh, a sense of duty. 
Um, and, and so I think that that's something that we have to have a serious conversation with, with all young people. And I, I'm the same way in terms of the cancel culture. I, 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 I feel that can, the cancel culture is there because people feel hopeless. They don't know how to fight the, the enemy. And so people start fighting themselves as a result. And we should have uh, honest conversations about this, this problem. I think that Grameen Bank example is such a good example of what you mentioned in your op-ed as well, that what essentially is, you know, Muhammad Yunus is thinking, even though he doesn't, uh, isn't a proponent of entitlement, is that, you know, you're given this small chance through these micro loans, but then what you do with it is up to you. And so there is still a seat at the table for you. We'll, get, we'll open the door for you, but then you have to go and make something with it. That's, exactly. I think... Um, well said. Example. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Yes. So we are at our final question, which um, I think is quite fitting because after hearing both of you speak, I feel, you know, a hundred times more motivated to get my start in the peace building kind of journey and space. Um, and with all that excitement, you know, comes uh, a little bit of a reality check. Um, Rome wasn't built in one day and peace will not be built in one day either, right? So with that in mind, um, in both of your experiences, or in all of your experiences, Mariam, please, you as well, share, um, what are some of the barriers, um, the greatest barriers to peace building right now? And I think that all of you have a very unique perspective because, you know, at MPAC, we have policy as well as narrative building. With Maya, we have, you know, art and narrative building. Mariam, you're in the journalism field. So what, what do you think some of these barriers are? Um, I'll gladly begin um, just by saying that peace building is difficult. It's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. Um, and I think that um, Salam, um, mentioned this sort of sometimes a culture of entitlement, you know, which is, which is a, a barrier because we have to be willing to get uncomfortable, profoundly uncomfortable. We have to challenge our own understandings and preconceptions and motives. And we have to, you know, I, we have to become ever stronger versions of ourselves. I um, have a confession to make, you know, I'm an environmentalist, but during this period, I've been using Amazon too much. And I've expanded my carbon footprint in that way. And, you know, I, I have to think about, well, how can I change that? It was just so convenient, um, you know, to be able to sit here, press a button and receive. And um, that's one example of, of many, but there are times when we have to, um, we have to be willing to lean into our discomfort and um, meet the particular needs of um, this time in this context with really difficult um, uh, conversations. Uh, and we have to acknowledge that positive change will lead to uh, loss, sacrifice, suffering, and that, um, that sometimes um, growth um, requires that we some experience uh, trauma. Um, so we have to, I think, um, think about how to move from um, PTSD to post-traumatic growth. Um, and, and we have to um, give some things up, you know, not just convenience, but sometimes real resources um, for more equitable distribution. We have to give up our seat. We have to, in order to invite others in, um, we have to be those champions that, uh, and I, I'm really grateful for the work that the Mo Muslim Public Affairs Council and all of you are doing um, to, um, to bear witness and and then to function as ambassadors i think that a lot of um what we see now is bifurcated storytelling wherein you know people get their news and media from one single source um and in doing so they um have a very parsed and narrow view of 
what it means to be American or what it means to. And so I think that we need to have more stories. Uh, we need to be able to diversify our sources. So one of the things that I challenge my students to do is um, Media Matters exercise where we look at a news story from 10 different sources around the world. And we sort of see in uh, the different ways that a story is told, what's emphasized or de-emphasized, what's ignored, where, um, where a story is placed, we begin to see a fuller version of the truth. And we need to ensure that all of us are spending time with sources of information and news that with which we disagree. Um, otherwise, we will never meet the challenge of, uh, uh, of understanding. And, and the misunderstanding that prevails right now will um, continue to cause conflict and diminish um, our capacities for peace building. Thank you, Iman, for um, including me in this question. It's, it's um... It's interesting because I've worked in covering war for the last 15 years in uh, the Congo, in um, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen. And so I, as a journalist, I do a very practical job. Who is doing what? Where are they? What are they thinking? What are they going to do next? And it's a lot of they, they, they. <laughs> and when I first connected with the peace studio about making a peace offering, I'm not sure if you actually know this, but later, later in the program, um, Later in the, in the project, I'll be contributing something from the field of journalism as a media maker. Um, I realized for the first time, nobody had asked me in a long time why I went into journalism at all, what I thought I was doing here. And it was such a shocking thing, the awareness of my own cynicism in some ways that maybe I had not asked myself in a long time why I got up every day to do my job. And I realized after really, really taking some time to think, I'm very lucky that I... Um, I'm here in Vancouver, which is on the unceded land of three Coast Salish nations, the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish, who are um, true storytellers. They are nations that have survived so much through keeping their stories alive and by uh, knowing who they are, no matter what. And I think that in journalism, what is an obstacle to peace that sometimes we forget when we're out there producing our media is that we aren't actually talking about they somewhere else. Mm -hmm. We are actually, when we do it right, maybe holding a mirror up to ourselves. And I think forgetting that we are not talking about bad people somewhere else doing something, that we are actually talking about ourselves and where we may have failed and where we may need to change how we're behaving. And that's a small and uncomfortable shift. And I heard you say something about mirroring through our storytelling, Maya, and that really rings true for me and something that I had not thought about in a long time, I'm embarrassed to say. But I think just asking that question through something like the offerings of peace, really even for me, someone who set out on this journey with that idea, um, can really re recatalyze people who are working in this field. Um, yeah, th this idea of, of mirroring ourselves in, through storytelling, I think that's very inspiring. It, it's causing me to think a lot uh, about how to how to move forward. And and, and even you know, and when we talk about war, the stories we get about war is very sanitized. We don't feel the suffering uh, of people when they have to deal with a, uh, a drone strike or they deal with militia uh, or terrorism. There's something that is preventing us from feeling and connecting with that tragedy. And we are responsible, we're culpable because a lot of our tax dollars go towards the, the militarization that creates war, that is responded to by terrorism and militancy that has to be uh, investigated by our government and people then are surveilled, and then people are, are, are uh, get detained, and they get, end up in prison, and some go to Guantanamo. And Guantanamo. And so yes, we're all in this, no, no matter what. So to understand that we are responsible from the beginning is, is, is number one. Number two, for the people in general, the greatest danger to faith is despair. Despair is something that is not a part of our faith. It should not be. 
Um, and there's a story of, of Prophet Yusuf and his father Jacob said, um, uh, uh, losing hope is only for those who deny God uh, because Joseph was out and, and he had not known where his whereabouts for years and finally he found him. So he always had that hope. And that is a message to us is that we have to keep that hope. For if for no other reason, if you are in despair, you are manipulated very easily. They can manipulate you uh, because of your anger, because of your regret, uh, resentment, and so on and so forth. People, you know, have, have done all these studies. How did Al-Qaeda start? And how did ISIS happen? And how did this happen? Very simple. People were desperate. They were in despair. They lost hope from, uh, of the rest of the world. And so they created their own way uh, that brought them belonging, belongingness. They talk about gang violence here. It's, it's very, very similar. So when we allow despair to uh, foment and ferment and fester, then this is the product of that. And more, more war will respond to these kinds of wars that, that is happening there. There was a question from, or something in the chat box somebody was asking, why don't you get all the Arabs to organize and get all the uh, foreign Muslim countries to organize? Let me just be very clear about the agenda of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. We are an American Muslim organization. We're here for America. We believe in American Islam. We believe in the promise of American Islam that will bring us peace for the United States within America and for the rest of the world. You wanna to go to some Gulf Sheikh or some tyrant and some dictator or some military thug and try to find Islam, good luck. Uh, we, we are not about that. We're about connecting with the people and first and foremost, connecting with the American people to make Islam known to the American public and to develop this pro promise of an American Islam that stands for what Islam says authentically and first and foremost is mercy and justice and compassion and liberation and getting to, getting to know one another. The Quran says, oh humanity, you have been created from a single pair, a male and a female, so that ye may get to know one another. That is the mission uh, of Islam and, and that is the mission of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. And, and similarly to how um, the United States can at times prioritize or unprioritize certain aspects, um, these weaknesses lie in other countries as well and their governments as well. And so when it comes to the power players, that's why it is so vital for um, the Muslim Public Affairs Council, for Dr. Maya, for Mariam to be doing the work that they do because we bring forward that you know, maybe we need to reassess our priorities a little bit. Um, and, and something that I'm, I'm hearing in, in every, in all of your sentiments for this question is this notion of empathy, right? One of the things I feel like some of us forget to recognize is whether it is a mother who has lost her child um, in, in Minnesota or whether it is in um, Palestine or Kashmir or, or wherever, a mother's heart is going to hurt, right? You're not going to ask her that, oh, the Minnesota heart hurts less or, oh, you know, the, heart, the hand that's cut in, um, you know, anywhere else is, is going to bleed any less. We are all humans. When cut, it hurts. When hungry, when, when hungry we're, we're, we're wanting, you know, um, there is so much more that connects us than that separates us. And I think that this notion is very vital in understanding the importance of peace building, because if we don't want, if, if, if it's a future that we would want for our families, it is vital that we work collectively so that no family is left out or behind, right? Um, and so with that, you know, I, I really want to thank everyone for such a lively discussion. I, I sincerely appreciate it. And then for our viewers, um, as always, folks, please feel free to reach out to us afterwards at hello at mpac.org. And please follow MPAC on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to stay the most up to date on all of our campaigns and programs programming. Um, if you know someone who would make a great addition to our team, we are now accepting intern applications and would be so excited to add thoughtful, compassionate, and driven individuals to our team. Um, our squad is very diverse and big, so we encourage all to apply. Um, and on behalf of MPAC, we would like to thank Dr. Maya Sotero and Maria Mashani for joining us on today's webinar. And I encourage each of our, our viewers today to please check out um, the Peace Studio's fantastic work 
by visiting their website, www.peacestudio.org. Um, and for anyone who missed this webinar or simply wants to watch it again, because I'm definitely going to be watching it again, um, you can catch it on our YouTube page, MPAC National. And until then, keep us in your prayers as you are always in ours. Stay safe, stay healthy, and remember, you are a vital piece for peace. So let's complete the puzzle together. Thank you all. Yay, aloha everyone. Thank you so aloha. much, Jack, and Thank all you of you are here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maya. Thank you very much. Wonderful. And we're really proud again and honored to be partners with you. Thank you.